American Institute of Certified Public Health. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. Speaking of stations that are airing this broadcast, you are listening to this show on bostonfreeradio.com or watching it on Somerville Community Access TV or some local affiliate near you, or you are watching and listening on Facebook Live, either on your own or on my personal Facebook page or on bostonfreeradio.com's Facebook page. Either way, you could join in me. Thank you for joining me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. I have three movies to review for you for this show, down from my usual five, because, let's face it, this Labor Day weekend was not particularly great for new movies. With that said, though, let me get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? The top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. So, number one at the box office two weeks ago was The Hitman's Bodyguard. Number one at the box office last week was The Hitman's Bodyguard. Guess what was number one this week? You guessed it, The Hitman's Bodyguard, holding steady at number one in its third week in release. And for a movie that altogether wasn't that great, it's pulling in some very impressive numbers. This weekend it grossed $13.4 million, which is still pretty low for Labor Day weekend, but more on that much later in the show. But on a budget of $30 million, The Hitman's Bodyguard has so far grossed $58.1 million here in the States and a staggering $97.1 million around the world, making The Hitman's Bodyguard a tentative hit here in the States, but next week, regardless of whether it's still number one or not, which it probably won't be, it will be a certified hit by next week, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Annabelle Creation, same deal. Number two at the box office three weeks ago, number two at the box office last week, Number two at the box office this week, having made $9.3 million. And the, and the numbers that Annabelle Creation is pulling in right now is quite staggering. On a budget of just $15 million, that's $1.5 million, Annabelle Creation has so far made $91 million here in the States and $255.4 million around the world, which means, given these numbers, we'll probably be seeing a sequel in the next couple of years. But Annabelle Creation deserves that because it is actually a much better movie than the Annabelle from 2014. Wind River is one of those films that started out quite slow in its when it first came out five weeks ago, but it is at its highest point yet. Last week it was number four at the box office. This weekend it's number three at the box office, having made $8 million just this weekend. Against a budget of just $11 million, Wind River has so far made $20.4 million in the box office in the United States, and around the world it has made $22.3 million. So while it has made $2.3 million in every other country besides the United States, Wind River is still a tentative hit here in the States and just barely a certified hit around the world. So very good for Wind River, and we'll probably be seeing more box office results of Wind River in the weeks to come. It's probably not going to leave the top five, let alone the top ten, but of course we will see. Number four at the box office this weekend was number three last week. This week it's number four. It's the movie Leap also known to other countries around the world as Ballerina. So Leap made a decent $6.6 .6 million this weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, ba uh, Leap has so far made $13.1 million here in the States and a staggering $96.2 million around the world. So even if it's not a hit here in the States, which it doesn't look like it will be, or maybe it will eke its way to being... A, a tentative hit, but around the world already it is a certified hit. Logan Lucky is a film that's gotten much better reviews than The Hitman's Bodyguard, including from yours truly, but is still not doing especially well at the box office. But it has 
It is number five at the box office this weekend, the same as it was last week. This weekend it grossed $5.6 million. Against a budget of $29 million, Logan Lucky has made $22.7 million here in the States and $27.1 million around the world, which means it's neither a hit here in the States or around the world, and that's too bad because it deserves better. Dunkirk, number six at the box office last week, number six at the box office this week, having made $5.6 million this weekend. On a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has so far made $180.3 million here in the States and $460.3 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit around the world, and it most likely will be certified sometime in the future. We'll just have to see. Spider-Man Homecoming, number seven at the box office last week, number seven at the box office this week, having made $4.7 million, which is quite decent for a movie that has, that's been out since the 4th of July and is still holding on there during Labor Day weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far made $325.1 million here in the States and $747.2 million around the world, which means it is a tentative hit here in the States, but most certainly a certified hit around the world. It may be a certified hit eventually, but we may not see it in the top 10 when it reaches $350 million. The Emoji Movie. I thought that movie would be gone by next week, by this week rather, last week. Last week it was number 10 at the box office. This weekend it climbed to number 8, which is really too bad because the movie sucks. It made $3.4 million at the box office. Against a budget of $50 million, the Emoji Movie has so far made $81.2 million here in the States and $160.4 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit worldwide. The other two movies that occupy the 9 and 10 slot are movies that were not in the top 10 last week. Despicable Me 3 was number 12 at the box office last week. This week it's number 9, having made $3.3 million. Against a budget of $80 million, has so far made $258.8 million here in the States and $994.9 million worldwide, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, The Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature, was number 11 at the box office last week. This week is number 10 at the box office, having grossed $2.9 million this weekend. Women now make up 37% of the workforce, changing their role forever. Harvard Medical School has now opened its doors to new female applicants. The first woman is now in space. The majority of last year's doctorate degrees were earned by women. We've come so far, but our news is changing for the worse. More women die from heart disease and stroke than men, even though it can be prevented. Make a change at GoRedForWomen.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m., Boston Time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and just finishing off my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, The Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature, as I said before the break, was number 11 at the box office last week. This week, it's number 10, having grossed $2.9 million. Against a budget of $40 million, it is still struggling, even though it's an animated film. It hasn't gotten the greatest of reviews. I can't say whether it's good or bad, because I haven't seen it, but my inclination is that it's probably not good. But against a budget of $40 million, The Nut Job 2, you know the rest, has made $26.7 million here in the States and $29.6 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet, or it may not ever be, here in the States or around the world. But it reached the number 10 spot because there really wasn't very much at the box office this Labor Day weekend. I'll get into more of my Labor Day results and more of a retrospective of the summer of 2017 in a moment. But first, I'm going to get to my reviews. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one that's come out 
five weeks ago, but I didn't get a chance to see it until this weekend. And that movie is Wind River, directed by Taylor Sheridan, who is an actor and director best known for having directed Sicario, which was one of the most underrated movies of 2015, at least when it came to Oscar nominations. I th just a brief digression, Emily Blunt should have been nominated for Best Actress for Sicario, but she was famously jilted at the Oscars, but she deserves better. And he directed probably one of the more overrated movies of 2016, Hell or High Water. Sorry about the ambulance, I guess that's just the, the town I live in and the studio from which I broadcast. But Hell or High Water was, I thought, decent, but I didn't think it was good enough to be nominated for Best Picture, which it was at last year's Oscars. But having said that, Hell or High Water was not a bad movie. I thought it was a good modern Western. And Wind River certainly has reflections of that modern Western in its theme and in its execution. So it's an original story written also by Taylor Sheridan, and it's about an FBI agent, played by Elizabeth Olsen, who is not exactly a rookie, but still a little wet behind the ears, who teams with a town's veteran game tracker, who's played by Jeremy Renner, to investigate a murder that occurred on a Native American reservation in Wyoming. So this is a movie that brings to mind a lot of thematic films about either the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest. And even though Fargo takes place in Minnesota and Wind River takes place in Wyoming, Wind River reminded me a lot more of Fargo than it did for me, say, Brokeback Mountain. But then again, Brokeback Mountain was a, a, ro a romance that took place, a tragic romance that took place in Wyoming, not a murder mystery. I would be spoiling it if I said there was a murder in that movie, but I'm just going to leave that blank. Whether or not you see that as a spoiler means you probably saw the movie. But anyway, this is a movie with actually, despite the fact that it has Jeremy Renner in the leading role and Elizabeth Olsen in a supporting role, it has a notable Native American cast in the film, including Academy Award nominee Graham Greene, who plays a local sheriff named Ben. There's also Julia Jones, who plays Jeremy Renner's ex-wife. And of course, there is the woman who is found dead in this movie, whose character's name is Natalie, and she's played by a relative newcomer named Cassie Asbile, or I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. It's Her last name's spelled A-S-B-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. I'm gonna pronounce it as Bel Belay, I could be wrong about that, as Bile, I'm not quite sure. But either way, she is very good in this film. And she is found dead in the middle of the woods by Jeremy Renner's character, who is more or less a, not an official police officer, but he is an officer of the Wyoming Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. In other words, he is a forest ranger, and he's just going about his daily routine, trying to get the coyotes away from the sheep and other prey wildlife, when he discovers the body of this woman, who he in fact actually knows, because this is Wyoming, this is an Indian reservation, and pretty much everyone in the small community knows one another. So it turns out that this girl who he found dead in the middle of the woods is a friend of his daughter's who was also murdered early on. So there's that interesting dynamic right there. I mean, not only interesting, but incredibly tragic dynamic. But of course, he has to inform the, the, the family of this dead girl. And it's also a little bit kind of a whodunit. It is a mystery, but you're not exactly solving the mystery along with the people in the movie, Elizabeth Olsen's character and Jeremy Renner's character. But still, there are a lot of great panoramic scenes. The story is incredibly engrossing. And even though you're not exactly picking up clues along with the people who are trying to solve this presume, presumably murder case, you are engrossed by the story and you're also horrified by the results, especially when you know that this girl, Natalie, might not have been murdered per se, in that 
She didn't spend the last moments of her life getting strangled, getting stabbed, getting shot by some murderer, but either way, she had a gruesome fate based on the fact that she wandered about six miles away from whatever she was running from in bare feet, in the snow. So that already brings to mind some very unpleasant images, not to mention when you see this movie, you're gonna be horrified by this woman's fate, but I'm not giving anything away. What I loved about this movie was not only the story and the characters, not to mention the performances by Jeremy Renner, and probably a breakthrough performance by Elizabeth Olsen, playing a character she hasn't really played before, one that's a little bit more grown up and certainly a fish out, out of water being a native of Fort Lauderdale here in the dead winter of Wyoming. But also, you get an appreciation for the people who live on Native American reservations, especially the Native Americans. And Wind River is probably one of the best films I've seen this summer and so far this year. It gets my rating of a knockout because there, what is there not to love about this film? You feel petrified, just struggling with your mortgage payments, not knowing what to do. You do nothing. But if you do something, you're far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call 888-995-HOPE to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about your options. Call 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on bostonfreeradio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Tulip Fever, which is one of the newest films to come out this weekend, but it wasn't in the top 10 this weekend in terms of highest grossing films, but I think you would probably actually be missing out if you overlooked this film because it is better than the marketing campaign suggests. Of course, I don't watch movie previews, so I don't know what the movie preview looked like, but the poster for Tulip Fever didn't give enough of an indication of how good this movie is for a number of reasons. Tulip Fever takes place approximately 1636, and it's about, and it takes place in Amsterdam, and it's about an artist, played by Dane DeHaan, who falls for a young married woman, played by Academy Award winner Alicia Vikander, while he's commissioned to paint her portrait and the portrait of her husband, who's played by Academy Award winner, two-time Academy Award winner, Christoph Waltz, during the tulip mania of 17th century Amsterdam. So what exactly is tulip mania? Well, apparently in the 1600s in Amsterdam, there was a period in which contract prices for bulbs of the recently introduced tulip reached extraordinary high levels and then dramatically collapsed in February 1637. So this period of tulip bulbs being of high value and of high market price and then their collapse is documented in a fictitious way in this film. And the film is actually from a screenplay by Tom Stoppard and Deborah Morgach, which is based upon the book of the same name, the novel, not a, a nonfiction book by Deborah Morgach, Mogach herself. And Tom Stoppard, you might, has actually had a number of screenwriting credits to his name, including Shakespeare in Love, for which I believe he won an Oscar. Yes, he did. He wrote a, he, he won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for Shakespeare in Love. He's also written screenplays for movies like Brazil, which is actually one of my favorite films. It's an odd 
odd film directed by Terry Gilliam, which bears quite a resemblance to 1984, so much so that Terry Gilliam considered calling the film 1984 and a half. Fortunately, he didn't do that, but anyway, so Tom Stoppard wrote the screenplay for Brazil, Empire of the Sun, which is an underrated film directed by Steven Spielberg, starring a then not quite as well-known Christian Bale when he was a young kid. And he also adapted such stories for the screen as Anna Karenina. And when I saw Tulip Fever, I was actually reminded quite a bit of Shakespeare in Love in the sense that this is a movie that takes place actually after um, really William Shakespeare's time because William Shakespeare died in 1616. But even though it takes place about 500 years ago or so, there's a certain accessibility to this film that people who are not history buffs or don't really care about the European Renaissance will still find appealing. For instance, Alicia Vikander in this movie is beautiful. And the attraction that her character has to Dane DeHaan is noteworthy. As a matter of fact, one of my criticisms about Dane DeHaan in the movie Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets was that he wasn't charismatic enough to take on such a leading role with the characteristics that he had. And I still stick to that criticism, but in this movie, Tula Fever, he certainly showed a lot more charisma and a lot more of a leading man status that was missing in the movie Valerian, which I, I think because Dane DeHaan lacked that star fever. That's the reason that Valerian and the City of the Thousand Planets, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that that, that movie bombed. I do have to say, Tulip Fever might not break box office records. In fact, it probably won't. But Dane DeHaan had a much more consistent performance, not to mention the, the attraction between him and Alicia Vikander in this movie was greater than the attraction or the perceived attraction that he had with Cara Delevingne, another very attractive and good actress in Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. But this movie was a lot more intriguing than I thought it would be. When you, when you hear about a movie that is about a painter who's painting a muse, and the attraction they have together. That doesn't exactly sound like an enticing film you'd want to pay $12 or more to see in theaters, but trust me when I say that not only do they get the feel of the period right, not to mention the, the styles of the paintings sort of in the same, the, the, the correct period during the Renaissance, but it is also a, a surprisingly sexy movie. And there, there are various lovemaking scenes between Dane DeHaan and Alicia Vikander, which were arousing and were titillating. And I was certainly drawn to the movie primarily for that reason, but there, there were other reasons as well. Not to mention that Christoph Waltz could have played this role of the stuffy husband who sees his wife more as an investment than a love interest, as somebody who's quite villainous, sort of one-sided in that snidely whiplash kind of way, which was one of my main criticisms of Christoph Waltz in his performance in Big Eyes. But fortunately, Christoph Waltz plays a much more three-dimensional character in this movie, and I really liked him for that. I also liked the the narration of the supporting characters played by Holiday Granger as a maid who gets pregnant and risks her career working for Christoph Waltz's character until she conspires a plan with Alicia Vikander's character, Sophia, to make it seem like she's pregnant only to escape the grips of her husband. I thought there was a lot of dramatic license going on here. A lot of it was appealing. It gets my rating of a knockout. I really hope 
a lot of people overlook the weak marketing campaign and see this film. I'm more resourceful than I thought. My suit can still make an impression. My video games are still game changers. And my lamp can bring others a bright future. Because when I donate my stuff to Goodwill, it helps fund job placement and training for people right in my community. Now my stuff gets a second chance. And will give someone in my community a second chance to Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at goodwill.org. That's goodwill.org. This message brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Hi, listen to me, Ed Robleski, every Wednesday from 5 to 7 for Talking Hendrix. We will celebrate the music and legacy of Jimi Hendrix's career and much more. Tune in every Wednesday from 5 to 7 only here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television, or some community access television station that is picking up this broadcast, which I appreciate very much, thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary called Step, which just came out actually a couple of weeks ago. It premiered at Sundance this year and debuted in several theaters nationwide on August 4th, 2017. The distribution of this film being an independent documentary hasn't been great per se, but um, it is still is, it, it still has a lot of things worth watching in it. I was, sorry about that, that was a little bit of a brain fart. But anyway, Step is about the, a, a certain charter school in Baltimore called the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. It's an all-girls school, and I believe that all the women who attend this Baltimore Leadership School are black women. I didn't see any Asian women, white women, or Latina women in the school, or at least not fully Latina, but yeah, the, the school is predominantly African American. And upon its inception in 2010, the purpose of this school was to have not only to embrace, educate, and empower, which is its motto, but it also had the auda audacious goal to send 100% of its graduates to college. And that's one of the primary challenges in this film of the girls who are not only attending the Baltimore Leadership School, but also take part in, the, in, in an activity known as stepping. In other words, stepping is kind of like cheerleading, except it's more performance arts. It's certainly a lot, a lot more aggressive than cheerleading, and there are no pom-poms. As a matter of fact, I, I hate to describe stepping in layman's terms, but I think you would probably n know stepping when you see it. So the members of this step team are all female, obviously, and they're all African American. And the people who are the, the people who are showcased most notably in this film include a young woman named Blessin Giraldo, who is a woman who started with the Baltimore Leadership School in the sixth grade and founded actually the STEP program. And she is a woman who is incredibly beautiful and probably could pass for one of Beyonce's backup dancers. But unfortunately, she is probably struggling to get into college more than any other girl who is showcased in this film. She's had a history of cutting class and she also struggles with her grades, but she's probably the primary focus in this movie because she's struggling the most to get into college. However, it's, it's really inspiring to see a woman like this seek help from her step coach and from her principal, from her guidance counselors, all within the school. In fact, probably the most inspiring part about this movie is not 
the STEP program in and of itself, although that certainly serves as a catalyst to get the story going in this film, but the support of the community of these girls who are fortunate enough to get into this charter school, because getting into this charter school requires being put into a lottery, and the the support that this school gives these young girls to not only get into college, but also obtain a scholarship. All these things are not very easy to do. And even though I personally didn't have to undergo these challenges to get into college myself, it was still challenging to go through taking the SATs, filling out the FAFSA form, of course, filling in the college applications, paying the college applications fees, but the difficulties that these girls have to get into college are multiplied and probably would be a lot worse if it hadn't been for this charter school and their commitment and dedication. But there are some girls who do not have to work quite as hard to get into college. There's one girl who is actually on track to be the valedictorian of her class named Corey Granger, who actually now, as of the date of this show, is a freshman at John Hopkins University. And that's, that's giving a little bit away, but not too much. There are also some other girls like Taylor Solomon, who is not only active in this STEP program, and will probably, and probably still is, since I don't think she was a senior when this, this film was, when this movie was being filmed in 2015 and 2016, but she certainly had an interesting relationship with her mother, who is actually one of the parents who is very much like Dennis Hopper's character in Hoosiers. She is very active in the step practices, perhaps a little bit too active, but you have to admire her dedication, even though she somewhat embarrasses her, <laughs> her daughter during the process at times. But there is a lot to love about Step. I hate to say that about films to which I'm going to give my rating of a knockout, which I will give my rating to, to Step. I think it is an inspiring documentary. I think even if you're not a woman, if you're not African American, if you don't live in a city like Baltimore, you'll still be inspired by the fact that not only higher education, but higher education that is dedicated to its students can bring someone whose odds are against them so far in life. And I really do wish the best for the women in this movie, not to mention the fact that especially in the, the narration that, or the narrative that involved Blessing Herald, Geraldo, that I really felt a lot of emotion for particularly Blessin, and I didn't want to see her fail. And if you're watching this movie, I don't think you'd want to see this woman fail either. But while I don't think Step is a, is a contender necessarily for the best documentary Oscar, I do think it is an inspiring documentary, and I think it's one that anyone who watches it will learn a lot from, and it could empower a lot of educators as well. Dear John, I'm leaving. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is serious, and I can quit whenever I want. Why can't we get back to when you checked on me? I don't want to leave, but remember, when I quit, you quit. Sincerely, your heart. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range today. Find out how at heart.org slash blood pressure. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s and all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, 
blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this has been a very, very slow weekend for movies, particularly new releases. In fact, of the movies I reviewed, of the three movies I reviewed, one of them was just released this past week, and it's one you probably haven't seen, which is called Tulip Fever. I gave that movie a knockout, and I do recommend you see it, but that's not the point of this coming segment. This is more of a retrospective of the summer of 2017, and according to an article by Vox, it is a, th this past summer was a Dickensian cliche. The best of times and the worst of times. It was the best of times critically, because I remember doling out a lot of, a lot more knockouts to films than I usually do. But in terms of box office receipts, this is where it gets kind of ugly. To put it in perspective, this Labor Day weekend was the worst performance of the box office in 17 years. Yeah, not since the year 2000 had the, had the box office performed as badly. And in terms of the summer, this was probably the worst performing summer of 2015. So there were a number of films, in fact, of the top five, of the top 10 films, released so far this year, five of them were the, were films that were released this summer. In fact, Wonder Woman is on track to be the number one highest grossing movie in the US of the year, but it might not reach that, that high because Beauty and the Beast has made, the, the remake of Beauty and the Beast has made nearly $100 million more than Wonder Woman. That being said, Wonder Woman is still out in theaters. It's inching its way towards making the number one spot. So it might actually pull out, it might actually end up being the number one movie of the year, but that has yet to be seen. I do have to say that it does deserve to be the, the top movie of the year, not only because it's really good, but it was so much better than the remake of Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast was a movie that wasn't bad. I gave it my rating of a checkout, but I had some problems with it, including the fact that it was a remake of a great movie, which is something that movies should never do, or movie studios should never remake great movies. They should remake bad movies. So Wonder Woman was the highest grossing film of this past summer. The second highest grossing film was of this past summer was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Third highest grossing, Spider-Man Homecoming. So you'll notice a pattern here. They're all based on comic book movies, but the fact that they were comic book movies does not necessarily vicariously make them the box office draws. In fact, word of mouth can, especially in this day of age, regardless of how easily accessible a movie is, despite how much tickets are, and despite advertising campaigns, really a make or break deal for movies. However, there are some exceptions. Dunkirk was a movie that really elevated itself through word of mouth. And it's been out for, I think roughly, let me just look that up. Dunkirk's been out for seven weeks, and it's never left the top ten so far. It eventually will, but right now it's, it's still holding steady and certainly attracting filmgoers who don't go for the, the comic book movie. But there were other movies that I thought were really great that should have done better at the box office than they ultimately did. For instance, War for the Planet of the Apes underperformed despite having a 93% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and an 82% rating on Metacritic. Not to mention, I gave it my rating of a knockout. Interestingly enough, as of this date, September 5th, 2017, 
War for the Planet of the Apes has made $24 million less than Kong Skull Island, which was far inferior. How did that happen? I don't know. But I think a lot of that has to do with advertising. But there are other reasons that the, the box office didn't quite hit the mark this summer. I think part of it had to do with sequel fatigue and remake fatigue. Because there weren't a lot of movies that came out this summer that weren't based on an already existing franchise or weren't based on a true story or weren't based on a novel. It, there were very, very few of those. I did think that the movies that were original this summer, like Brigsby Bear and Ingrid Goes West, were legitimately great movies, but they were released independently and not a lot of people got to see them. They didn't have the advertising budget of Wonder Woman or of Spider-Man Homecoming. And there's something to be said about that. And yeah, there is the argument that a lot of people prefer to just stay home and stream a movie or TV show. That's notable. But the streaming, res th these movies that are released independently and to TV sets near you uh, through streaming devices like Amazon Prime or Hulu are not are still not getting the attention of or the the viewership of these other films that have bigger advertising budgets and well there it's really hard to pinpoint one particular area that results in this slump that the the box office had this summer i mean a, a movie buff like me We'll go to a theater no, no matter what and still have a great time at the movies. That's one of the perks of this job that I have. But a, one problem I've noticed at theaters, particularly at multiplexes, is tickets are way too expensive. And yeah, when you stay home and stream a movie on Netflix, on Hulu, on Amazon Prime, you pay a certain amount per month. I think that movie theaters might have to adopt that kind of subscription service to survive. It's not a bad idea to pay 20 to $30 a month to see an unlimited amount of movies. Yeah, it would, it would probably skew box office results, but honestly, there are a lot of things the theaters are doing wrong. At the Regal Fenway Theater, which I used to frequent until recently, until the prices went up, to see a matinee is $13. That's more to see a mainstream film probably anywhere else in America. That's a problem that individual movie theaters will need to address. Costs are outrageous. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer evening. It's everybody over for Sunday dinner and your family sleeping in their own beds at night. Making home affordable is a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Call 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. I love those real six signs. They're the ones that move. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on All Happy Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And getting on with my topic, which was, and for those of you who tuned in late, why the summer of 2017 was a slump for summer movies. Certainly the quality of summer movies are still there, but not a lot of people are going out to theaters anymore. And before the break, I was mentioning that movie theater ticket prices are becoming more and more outrageous. It used to be back in the 50s and 60s that a matinee was a big draw because of the fact that matinees were cheaper and plus when you wanted to do something fun especially on a summer day 
particularly on a rainy summer day, you go out and you see a movie. That's something I still do for fun, but it's not something not a lot of other people do for fun. And I think one of the main reasons for that is because tickets and ticket prices are getting unnecessarily expensive. And I, I know that there's inflation and prices have to adjust to inflation, but it really says something when a movie theater like Regal Fenway has 14, costs $14.70 to see a movie that is not 3D and not RPX. Now, to see a movie that's in RPX at Regal, Fenway, is $5 more. And to see a movie that's 3D is $3 more than regular admission. So to see a movie that's, all, that's 3D and RPX costs over $20. That's outrageous. And also, Regal Fenway in particular has gotten so niggardly that it, it charges fourteen seventy for a mainstream movie in prime time that's not 3D and for, uh, during the weekend, Friday through Sunday, and fourteen twenty if it's Monday through Thursday. They have to stop being so particular and so stingy about their movie tickets. And yeah, I'm picking on Regal Fenway, but, and I, I realize that it's in a popular, in an area which has gotten more property value over the last couple of years, but honestly, if you're raising your tickets prices that much, I don't think you're gonna be open by next year. I, I think that the Fenway crowd and the high-rise apartments are going to boot you out of there. So there, there is a problem with ticket prices and not just in heavily populated areas like the, the Boylston Streets or Brookline Avenue section of Boston. I think it's also a problem in smaller areas as well. There, there has to be some sort of consistency with ticket prices. And one of the things I think will be a big box office draw is if movie theaters stop charging more for 3D or for high quality sound or whatever. I think that 3D prices should be exactly the same as regular prices. I think you're gonna be, I, I think you're gonna see a surge in movie ticket sales if that's the case. Or if it, you're going to charge more for a 3D movie, it should be $1 maybe, or $2 at most. Also, there is the annoying movie experience of people who are talking or texting during a movie. I have to say for a guy who's been going to move the movies three to five days a week, I haven't experienced that as much. I think it is a problem in theaters worldwide, but I personally haven't experienced that. I think that's particularly either because the, the audience I've seen, I've seen movies with have been more cognizant of that, or because fewer people are going to theaters because of that stigma, which kind of eliminates the problem if you think about it. But I do think that movie theaters are being properly cognizant of people talking or texting, using their phone during a movie. I know I, for one, turn my cell phone off during a movie, and that's a habit that a lot of people, a lot more people should get into, but I'm not one to tell you what to do. But I do have to say that movie theaters also have gotten into a habit of probably screening a lot more things before the movie that make people pick up their phones and text, play games, whatever. How about showing content before a movie that you won't see anywhere else? You won't see on YouTube, you know, unless a, a pirate put, puts it up or some online piracy happens, but let, that's another topic for another time. Why not show an original cartoon before a movie? That's what Disney films have done, especially Disney Pixar films, to great success. In fact, th there's a Disney Pixar movie coming out this November called Coco, which has an animated short in the very beginning of it of Olaf from the, the snowman from Frozen. So that's gonna draw a lot of people in. But even movies that aren't family friendly should have some cartoon or some sort of original content. Why not even a short film? 
short films should be played before every movie. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cartoon. As a matter of fact, I've been to film festivals like the Boston Underground Film Festival, and I have seen short films that I am astonished are not readily available either on YouTube or on Netflix, Hulu, whatever, on any other streaming service. And I think to myself, if you put a short film in front of any film, that any mainstream film, you will get people talking and they're gonna think to themselves, what was that film I just saw and what is that director gonna come out with next? I, you know, it's something that a lot of indie studios, or excuse me, not, well, yeah, indie studios and also independent theaters are latching on to. The idea that a movie is not just you sitting in front of a screen, it's an experience. And I do think that some mainstream theaters are starting to get the experience part, but unfortunately the experience, quote unquote, means getting a meal, sitting in a plush chair, and overall paying a larger expense for seeing a movie than you would otherwise in an indie theater or even sitting at home. And I think that that's a problem, and I think that's a pervasive problem that's really affecting box office grosses right now. It certainly shows in the summer of 2017. So it's not the quality of the movie. It's, it's basically the accessibility of it. And if you can stay home and stream it for less than you'd go to pay to see at a theater, I think a lot more people are taking that option right now. So you see, son, good manners are important. Should I go through it again? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Exactly. Always say please, thank you, you're welcome, and excuse me. Sit up straight, hold doors open. Don't speak with your mouthful. Keep your elbows off the table. Share your things, play nice, and generally treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Got it? Got it. And stop picking your nose. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show you are listening to on bostonfreeradio.com, listening and watching on Somerville Community Access TV or a community access station that has been kind enough to pick up this broadcast. Thank you. Or you are listening and watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So now I've done all the reviews I need to do for this show and the movie news, so it's now time for my next segment, What's Coming Out Next? This is a spoken word sneak preview of the films that are coming out this coming weekend. And the opinions I express on these movies are not how I think these movies are going to be. I keep an open mind about all these films, but I also make some predictions about how these films are gonna do. They're also not an advertisement or endorsement for any films. I'm not telling you to see these movies or not to see them. That is entirely your prerogative, but I'm letting you know exactly what I think about them. So, with that said, let's get into what's coming out this coming weekend, the weekend of September 8th through 10th. And this is where the fall movie season kicks into high gear, beginning with the highly anticipated big screen adaptation of Stephen King's groundbreaking novel, It. So this is a plot that doesn't need any introduction for Stephen King fans, but for those of you who are not Stephen King fans, it is about a group of bull bullied kids who band together when a monster, taking the appearance of a clown, begins hunting children. The movie stars Bill Skarsgård, Jaden Lieberheimer, Finn Wolfhard, and Sophia Lillis, amongst other people. I don't think there are any famous people in this movie, but I think that is a very good move. A lot of people have fond memories, if not nightmares, 
about the 1992 TV movie starring Tim Curry as Pennywise. That was a movie that scared the hell out of me when I was a kid. I look back at it now, some parts are a little silly, but it, th this movie that's coming out in theaters this weekend, is probably guaranteed to be scarier than the TV movie, in part because the TV movie was not rated R. Yes, it was a horror TV film, but it was made for FCC standards. But it is a movie that I will definitely be seeing this coming weekend, and I will let you know what I think about it next show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters is one called Home Again. This is a movie that stars Reese Witherspoon, and it's about a single mom whose life in Los Angeles takes an unexpected turn when she allows three young guys to move in with her. The movie also co-stars Nat Wolf, Lake Bell, and Michael Sheen, amongst other people. It's directed by Hallie Myers Shire, who has directed such films in, well, actually, this is her directorial debut. And she also, it's also her screenwriting debut. So this is a movie that is completely hers, and she has acted in a number of movies before this, such as What Women Want, the 1998 remake of The Parent Trap, and she also was seven-year-old Annie Banks in Father of the Bride Part Two. Not to mention, oh yeah, she was also in Father of the Bride Part One as a flower girl. So yeah, she's a young woman. She's only 30 years old, in fact, barely. Yeah, she's actually just turned 30 this year, and she's making her directorial debut in a movie with Reese Witherspoon. That's incredible. So it's a movie that looks like a romantic comedy, and it's, I, I don't particularly like romantic comedies, but it's a movie I will see when I get the chance, and I will let you know, I will probably let you know what I think next week. The other movies that are coming out are those that are in limited release, such as a movie called The Good Catholic, which is a religious movie, but unlike other religious movies that focus more on Protestant religions, of course, this one is Catholic. So anyway, The Good Catholic is about a priest named Daniel who loves his job as a small-town priest more than anything. Then he met Jane. God help him. The movie stars Zachary Spicer as the, as the titular Good Catholic, not to mention the priest, and it also co-stars Danny Glover and John C. McGinley. So this is a movie that looks like a religious film, but I can't exactly say if it is actually one of those religious movies. I mean, it is about a priest, of course, but I'm not sure if it has the same sort of message as other religious movies as before. Hopefully it's better than either God's Not Dead movie or Do You Believe, which for those of you who have paid attention are movies I absolutely hated upon their release. but. I might see this movie. I can't guarantee whether it comes out in theaters near me or not, particularly next weekend, but I'll let you know what I think if I see it. But anyway, that, ju that just about does it with Words on Film for this week. Words on Film, again, is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise were solely those of yours truly. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole.